I don't know why I was thinking, but after I was going to finish this song, I was going to go sit down. Good to be here this day. Wonderful to be here. It's a beautiful day. I know back in Colorado, they're getting ready for another round of winter. So it's good to be here. The title for this uh, this sermon this morning is The Blessings of Forgiveness. And that was said especially for Denise back there. What is the greatest problem that man is faced with? And there's a lot of problems in this world today that we can probably just conjure up in our mind, the top of our heads, if you will. But all of the problems really stem from this one thing, and that's sin. And that's the lack of forgiveness of that sin. Sin and its consequences. We know that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God because Paul told us that in Romans 3.23. All have sinned come short of the glory of God. The word sin has been defined as to miss the mark. Sometimes people shoot over it and go before it. Some people shoot under it and come last. But it's missing the mark. And all, everyone will sin sooner or later. And we know that the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. Always intrigued me that word wages. We know what wages is. It's something that we've worked for. It's something that we've earned. This is not something that we want to work for or earn. It is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4, another definition. Sometimes it is defined as iniquity. Jesus uses that word in Matthew 7, 23, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work. Iniquity. Man who lives in open rebellion to God will not even be able to use the excuse that I did not know. Because 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8 removes that excuse. That's not a reason for one to lose their soul. And what is the solution? Well, I'm speaking to Christians. We know what that solution is, and that is Jesus the Christ, who came to this world to die on that cross that mankind could be forgiven of their sins. And Jesus stated, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. John chapter 10, verse 10. So the wages of sin is death, that's true. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through him we have the forgiveness of our sins. Colossians 1, 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. We sing that song, Power in the Blood, and I thought about adding that a little too late, but that would have went right along with this sermon. Brother Paul probably would have put it in there. But what is forgiveness? What does that really mean? What does forgiveness mean? And what blessings does forgiveness bring to those of us who are Christians? It's an endless blessing if we stay faithful. As we mentioned in Bible class, good next, good dictionary, a good Bible dictionary, a good lexicon. Look the word up. You'll come across with a clear definition of forgiveness and how it is used throughout the scriptures. The American Heritage Dictionary defines forgiveness as to excuse for a fault or an offense. In other words, to pardon. Vines, a dismissal or release, is used as a remission of sins and is actually translated as forgiveness in Mark 3, 29, Ephesians 1, 7, and as we noticed earlier, Colossians 1, 14. Henry Thayer in his Greek lexicon defined it as a release from bondage or imprisonment. To what? To sin. 
It's a pardon of sins. Letting them go is if they have never been committed. That's another definition for the word justified. It's also defined as remission of the penalty. And all of these things give us a clear understanding of what that word forgiveness means and how it will help us to attain eternal life in heaven. And forgiveness is a great blessing. I was thinking as I was working uh, on this, this sermon, those of us who grew up in the Lord's church, who grew up in the church of Christ, that's a blessing. Those of us who had Christian parents, that's another blessing. So when we think about when we were baptized and we had been forgiven of our sins, I don't know if it actually brings the same kind of joy of, of someone who did not grow up in the church. Maybe they just grew up in the world. Or maybe they came out of a denomination to obey the truth. For them, that feeling of being forgiven may even be more than what we feel. We understand it's going to happen. For them, they didn't expect it. They're overflowing with joy because they've been forgiven of their sins. But is there a, a greater blessing than being forgiven? Romans chapter 4, verse 7, Paul wrote, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed comes from the Greek word makarios, as in Matthew chapter 5 and the Beatitudes. The basic simple meaning is happy is that individual who's been forgiven of their sins. Is there a greater blessing than having our sins covered over, as in buried, forgiven, forgotten about by God? He will not keep bringing up those mistakes or sins that we've made in the past. He does not do that. Man does, but God doesn't. In Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. An indescribable gift. We talked about John 3.16 this morning in Bible class. That beautiful golden verse, that golden text of the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's indescribable to me. How do you really describe that in words? We can say right along with Paul, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable Gift, 2 Corinthians 9.15. Unspeakable. New King James Version uses the word indescribable. That's how wonderful being forgiven is. Spiro Zodiades in his lexicon states, this is incapable of adequately expressing or uttering. Indescribable. Unbelievable. Now, as God commandeth all men everywhere to repent, Acts 17, 10, whosoever, going back to John 3, 16, is anybody and everybody. There's no limitations. This is un universal in scope. Anyone who believes in Jesus as that Son of God, who follows his plan of salvation, will be forgiven of their sins. I know we remember, no matter how many years ago it was, we remember what it felt like when we were forgiven of our sins, when we were baptized. It troubled me, I think I was 14 years old, that something would happen to me and I would, 
I would die of sin in my heart. I remember what it felt like to remove any doubt whatsoever to coming in contact with the blood of our Lord and Savior that he shed. 1 John chapter 1, a number of times we look at this, this chapter and the number of things that it states. Do a study sometimes on the word if that you will find in a number of those verses. The word if, as in 1 John 1, 7. If, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanseth us from all sin. Now that word walk, of course, is one of those old words, means to live. That's a verb. So is the word cleanseth. Verbs show continuous action, if you remember your English grammar studies. So if we continue to live or to walk, keep on walking in God's holy word, his blood will keep on cleansing us of sin. If, verse 9 of that text, we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all, all sin, all iniquity. 1 John 1, 9. So forgiveness is a blessing. It's a spiritual blessing. How many people today receive even one spiritual blessing? Only those who are in the Lord's church, who followed his plan of salvation, that God, that Lord has added them to his church, Acts 247. Only New Testament Christians. So there's a lot of good people out there in one false religion after another. They won't receive even one spiritual blessing if they're not in Christ because they have to be under his name. They have to follow him, not Buddha, not Confucius, not Mohammed, not John Smith, none of the so-called modern teachers in the denominations. That won't bring you forgiveness. It won't bring you salvation. Acts 4 verse 12 we read, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Only Jesus' name, only his. So only Christians can receive forgiveness of their sins. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in whom? In Christ, Ephesians 1, 3. So what are some of these blessings? We know we have the blessing of forgiveness of our sins and, and that should be enough and really it is but there's some other blessings one of those blessings is the blessing of peace in our life by being forgiven of sin by being now in fellowship with God there are certain places in this world that seemingly never has peace for very long. The Middle East, that comes to mind with Israel, with the Arabs, now the Persians from Iran. It just is a constant conflict and this goes back thousands of years. They have no peace. What is worse, is someone who has no peace spiritually speaking because they're not under God's favor, his blessing. Sin separates us from God and it actually makes us an enemy with God and we do not want to have him as an enemy. Matthew twelve thirty: he that is not with me is against me. That's pretty much cut and dried. 
That means what it says. It says what it means. There's no misunderstanding it. There's no in-between. There's no gray area. If we're not with him, we are against him. And we will lose. And we will lose spiritually speaking. Friendship of the world, James 4, 4. James says it's enmity with God. Another definition for that word is hostility. We don't want to have that kind of fellowship. That's not fellowship at all. If we know that we are at enmity or hostility with God, what do we do about it? How can we have any peace? Well, you can't. And I think of the haunting words of David in Psalm 51, verse 3, where he stated that his sins are always before me. He couldn't get away from them. He was faced every day, every minute of every hour of every day with that sin that he committed with Bathsheba, and it would be there until God forgave him. Couldn't escape it. And that's the world. The people in the world have no peace in their lives whatsoever. In Isaiah 57, verse 20 and 21, Isaiah put it this way. But the wicked are like the troubled sea, when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. You ever been out to the beach, storms coming in, and the waves hit the beach, and what's in those waves is all that mire and dirt and seaweed and driftwood? That's sin here, according to Isaiah. There used to be an old bumper sticker. I haven't seen it for years. It said, no God, no peace, K-N-O-W. The second part said, no God, no peace, but in this case it was N-O. If God's not in your life, you will not have any peace, and that is correct. If we do know him, which means being obedient to him, knowing his word, faithfully following it, we can have peace, even in this life. Who doesn't want peace in the world that we live in? I sure do. And this was something that he gave to his disciples before he left, before he went back up into heaven. And it's something that he's also left with us, his modern day disciples. It's found in John 14, 27. It states, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I was thinking this morning, reading over this for the 332nd time. No, I'm just kidding. But I was thinking about the writings, the historical writings about the Christians going in to the Colosseum. And they were singing songs, knowing that they were going to die a horrible death, painful. They were worried about it. They were with the Lord. They knew that they would have an eternity of peace in heaven with him that could not be taken away. So they didn't fear those things. And I'll tell you what, when they went into that Colosseum and they started singing those songs, I bet you those people in the Colosseum who were waiting for blood never heard that before. That was how strong their faith was. And I honestly think that this terrified the empire of Rome like nothing else. If you can't force a people to be obedient then you can't force a people to be obedient. You can't have hold anything over their heads, and they couldn't do that. 
So forgiveness brings peace. Peace with our God. Peace with others who are faithful. Paul even wrote about that peace that comes to Christians in Ephesians chapter 2. That peace would also unite Gentile and Jew that it tore down that middle wall of partition that they could be won in the Lord's church. They didn't always have that. They were slaves to the world at one time until they obeyed the gospel. But forgiveness also brings a blessing of hope. How many families, and I've been in some of these rooms, how many families have sat at the bed of a loved one and heard the words, there remaineth no more hope? You're going to die. It's just seconds or minutes away. It's hard. It's easier to take when that loved one is faithful to God. You will miss them. I don't know if they'll miss us because they're going to be in paradise. What's worse than that is preparing for our deaths and there remains no hope for us spiritually. For those who face the Lord on the day of judgment, no hope. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you, is what they'll hear. That's not something that any of us want to hear. That's what's worse. We talked about the Gentiles in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. It said that they had no hope. Without God in the world, at one period of time, that was true. They didn't. But they were washed. They were sanctified. They were justified. They could stand before God as if they never committed a sin because they had been forgiven of those sins that they committed. What a wonderful blessing. They had the hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Titus 1, 2. Rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Romans 5, 2. Those of us who are faithful, we can rejoice in that hope of the glory of God that we'll see him one day for all eternity. We'll be with the faithful. And there are so many things in this life, as we all know, that can make shipwreck of our souls. There's so many temptations out of there. There's so many stumbling blocks in the world. Easy to grab hold of. And we know we can't. We know it's not worth it. Pleasure for a short period of time will not make up for an eternity being in the fires of hell in complete total darkness because we've been separated from God. And I think also one of the worst things for the child of God is to remember when they were faithful and they didn't have to be where they're at now. They could have repented of those sins and would do anything that they could to go back in time and ask for God's forgiveness. But they didn't do it. Now Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19, it states, Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. There's a song that comes from this verse. Where are our anchors today? You think about that anchor that keeps a, a ship steadfast. It's not going to be pushed away through some storm or something like that. It won't be tossed to and fro. If our anchor is here on earth, we're in trouble. But if our anchor is in heaven, that's because our mind, ourselves are there. 
That's where our treasures are as well. If our anchor is in heaven, we're going to be okay. We'll be fine. Have you ever come across someone who believed that they could never be forgiven of all the sins that they committed? Anybody ever tell you that? There's no way God can forgive me of these things that I've done. And some may be horrible sins. But that's an individual who doesn't know the power of God, that doesn't know the power of the blood of Christ that can forgive all sins no matter what we've done. And sometimes, yes, maybe even sometimes people use that as an excuse so they don't have to change their lives. But there are individuals over time who've committed horrible crimes, horrible sins. Peter denied Jesus three times, but he repented. God forgave him. There's some murderers who've committed crimes. Serial murderers who've committed crimes. And they reached out while they were in prison for someone to teach them the gospel. And they obeyed the gospel. And if their heart was right, no matter the sins they committed in that past which were atrocious, God forgave them of those sins. And they could leave this world still faithful. They could leave this world in a saved state. People who say that don't realize the power of God. We know that man is justified by his blood, Romans 5, 9, sanctified by it, Hebrews 13, 12. That redemption is found in his blood, Ephesians 1, 7. Paul even referred to himself as the chief of sinners, probably a hyperbole, an exaggeration. To, he wanted to make a point, but the chief of sinners. And he did persecute the church. He had people put to death and put into prison. And God forgave him. And think of the great wonderful works that he did for him. So those who believe that God can't forgive us of our sins should read 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Beginning in verse 9, there's a long list of sins that the Corinthians had been involved in, had, past tense. Beginning in verse 9, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? And he goes into that list. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now notice verse 11. And such were some of you. You all had committed these sins, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, set apart, but ye are justified. He could, they could stand before God as they never committed any of these sins. They are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. All those sins that they had committed, and homosexuality is one of those in verse 9. All were forgiven. They had changed. They bend their stubborn will and brought it into subjection to God's will. That change of mind that led to a change of heart, that led to a change of action, a change of lifestyle. This is what the Corinthians were able to do. And this is not the only case. First Timothy 1, verse 9 through 10 also very similar, that points out these things. Paul is addressing how the law was made, not made for the righteous, but sinners. And also he gives a long list of their transgressions. 
Jesus himself stated, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. Luke 19.10. And he stated in Matthew 9.13, For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That's why he came to this earth. To die on the cross for sinners. Forgiveness is attainable by all. By everyone. Does it matter what you look like? Does it matter your status? Does it matter how much money you make? Everyone can be forgiven. It doesn't matter how many sins you've committed. If you tear, turn your life over to God, you can be forgiven of those sins. By the way, that individual I talked about his name was Jeffrey Dahmer. Brother Garland Elkins taught him the gospel. Very intelligent man. He obeyed the gospel. He was also killed in prison. The thing of it is, if he truly believed and truly repented, his sins were washed away. If he remained faithful, He's in paradise at this very moment. That's the power in the blood of Christ. And Jesus made it possible for all of us. Through the death on that cruel cross, have you ever thought to yourselves during the Lord's Supper what it would feel like if they drove those spikes through your hands and through your feet, then raised you up on that cross? to the point where it would just fall and come to a sharp stop and then hang there by those nails for six hours. Painful, beyond measure. He taught us that this is possible from his word that he left us, from his example he set, from his church that he purchased and he died for we can have forgiveness. How does it come about? Well, a good example is found in the book of Acts. You study all of those conversions that are found, examples that are found in the book of Acts, and it has been referred to as a book of conversions. You see the importance of hearing, of believing, of repenting, confessing, being baptized for remission of sins. Not all five in one Example there, but you will read a baptism in all of them. God made that point. But even Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost when the church started, you think about the preaching of the apostles, and I know we've heard this a thousand times or more. That's okay. Now it's thousand and one. We need to be reminded of these things. The people who were gathered from all over the world on Pentecost, and there may have been a couple million in that city that day, who heard the gospel of salvation, maybe for the first time, the gospel of Christ. And when they had heard from Peter that they had sacrificed with their wicked hands the Son of God, the Messiah that they had been waiting for for around 1,500 years, they interrupted his sermon. Men and brethren, what shall we do? What must we do? They wanted to know right now. They didn't want to wait to the invitation. They wanted to know right now. And of course we know what verse 38 points out. They were to repent, be baptized for the remission of their sins and they would also receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. And about 3,000 obeyed the gospel that very day. And the Lord added them to his church, as Acts 2.47 points out. That example is still true today. If you want to be forgiven of your sins, you have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, John 8.24. If you do not believe, stop right there. No reason to even bring up the rest. 
because you won't be saved. But if you do, and you're ready to repent of your sins, as Luke 13, 3 and verse 5 points out, Acts 17, 30, and are willing to confess his name before others, Acts 8, 37, and be baptized for the remission of sins, as we mentioned in Acts 2, 38, or as Mark 16, 16 points out, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. But if you're willing to do this, his plan still works today. It will save you from your sins. Your sins will be forgiven, washed away. You can stand before God and every way, uh, everyone justified sanctified, set apart from the world into his marvelous kingdom to do his will. Greatest plague upon man is sin. And Jesus is the only answer for that. That's the only way someone can be forgiven of their sins. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Would you like to receive those blessings this morning? Be forgiven of your sins. Have that blessing of, of hope. Have that blessing of, of peace. Knowing that in the state that you're living in, having all those things, eternal life will be yours in heaven for all eternity, and nobody can take that away. If you're willing to follow his plan of salvation, you can do that this very morning. As a child of God, if you have fallen away, if you need the prayers of the church on your behalf to be forgiven of sins, maybe you have stumbled, maybe you have faltered, you need the prayers of the church on your behalf to be forgiven of, of some public sin, now is your opportunity to make things right with God. Let's all please stand and sing.